we want to make sure that we do it safely as we extend the invitation to return to the church to our membership. We want to make sure that we do it very safely, um, not to rush back in, but to come back in a pace that uh, we can still keep our distancing like we're doing today. Amen. You won't hear me? No. Because I'm hearing an echo in my ear. I don't know. Uh, if you can raise my monitors up just a little bit, I appreciate it. Amen. Well, this morning I wanted to talk about the power source. And we're going to be uh, teaching from John in the fourth chapter, verses 5 through 7. I'm going to be reading in the Amplified Version this morning. You all continue to pray for the bereaved families of our church, uh, brother and sister Fred and Keisha Laws, on the passing of their son, Lavelle Brown, a young man, 31 years old, afflicted with cerebral palsy for all of his life. So we never came into a church, never had the opportunity to walk to use his limbs. We should be so grateful when his parents loved him, took care of him, and kept him for 31 years. We thank God for that. We pray for them daily as God continues on the journey with that family. And also I want you all to pray for the Parker family, Sister Parker and Brother Parker, members of our church, well, Brother Parker went home to be with the Lord a few days ago. So you all keep Sister uh, Parker lifted in prayer. He, we, uh, we get a chance, we'll announce the services. We haven't received those from the family as of yet. And I think there's a few more people who pray for Sister Linda Hood. She's been hospitalized, I believe, for about three or four weeks now. So continue to keep her in prayer. And I think there's one other one that I'm missing. Um, who do we have? Vanessa Allen. Yeah, Vanessa Allen lost her brother as well. So you all keep Sister Allen in your prayers. Amen. Well, if you have John 4, reading from 5, 7, 5 to 7, you'll find these words. And in doing so, he arrived at Samaritan at a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the tract of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down to rest by the well. It was then about the sixth hour, about noon. Presently, when a woman of Samaria when a woman of Samaria came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. And so the title of this message is Two Power Sources. Amen. Two Power Sources. You may have your seats this morning. Well, a lot of people have been worried about the church, the country particularly those saints of God from all denominations, somewhat concerned about what's going to happen and what has happened to the church. And I just want to assure those that my voice reaches this morning that the church is going to be just fine. Jesus said in his word that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Well, since March of this last year, most church buildings have been closed, but the real church has remained in business. The church, the real church, has not gone out of business. The real church is a very particular and peculiar family of people. The scripture says it's a royal priesthood. It's a people that live holy. It's people like you, people like me. We're located in different parts of the city, the state, 
the country, and the world. But we have one thing in common, and that is Jesus is our Lord. You know, some people have found it convenient to stay at home and watch church via the internet, the app, TV, and it's become quite convenient because sometimes we use that phrase that the church is not the building. The church is not the building. So that gives one the assumption that it's okay to stay at home and still be part of the church. And that assumption is true. You can do that. But what family member has no desire to be around other family members? Anybody can distance, distance themselves from the church body and get comfortable in doing so. But the real church enjoys the assembly of the saints because they participate in the building and the fellowship of the kingdom of God. Nehemiah needed the assembly of the saints to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Gideon needed 300 assembly of the saints to chase the enemies away. Joshua needed the saints to walk around the walls of Jericho and bring those walls down. John the Revelator said, let us be glad and rejoice. He didn't say let I. Yeah. He said let us. So you can't always have real church by yourself. In the bedroom, the living room, and in the kitchen. The psalmist wrote, this is the day which the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We. So we got to be careful not to develop a mindset. It is going to be okay that once the church is open up, that we kick back, turn on the TV, and watch church. That's not going to work. For the real church. You know, Friday I asked my neighbor, my next door neighbor, I asked him, I said, um, are you working at home? Are you still working at home now? He says, yeah, I'm working at home, but on Wednesday, which happened to be January the 20th, the inauguration, he said, I had to go into work because the government was concerned that terrorists would attack the nuclear plant. The nuclear plant. That's where he works at. He's in security. And so they wanted to make sure that the nuclear plant was not under a threat by people that would try to destroy it. And while people were concentrating on protecting the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on that same day, that concern and protecting the Capitol buildings in every state, that was a concern. There were some that knew that the real power or a different type of power was also in the nuclear plants around the USA. Nuclear power plants were being threatened. So the real power was not necessarily in Springfield or in Washington, D.C. So we have to think about that because while we're trying to protect the bank accounts, while we're trying to protect the national debt and church buildings, we should be paying attention to the enemy's efforts to destroy the real power, and that is the kingdom of God. The real power. 
you know, after the uh, inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris, there was a weight that was lifted from the shoulders of people all over the world. I don't know how y'all felt. I heard some TV personalities and some church folks say that they can, they can finally rest easy at night. Finally, they can finally breathe again. Even Dr. Fauci was smiling when I saw him on TV. People were just tired and people were just worn out. Just So that brings us to John chapter 4, when Jesus was sitting at the well in Samaria. The scripture says in first verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Listen to me. The scripture says, when therefore the Lord Jesus Christ knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count we overlook this sometime in scripture. He realized that the Pharisees were taking account of how many people John was baptizing and how many people that Jesus was baptizing. It was on the post. They took the numbers and recorded it because their desire was to create conflict between Jesus and John. And we have Pharisees today that also take information, misinterpret it, so that it will divide the church and divide the country. So Jesus knew what the Pharisees were up to. As a matter of fact, if you're going to say something, if you're going to keep a record, make sure it's accurate. Because they were saying that Jesus baptized more than John, and Jesus didn't baptize any. His disciples did it. But they knew that a house divided will not stand. The Pharisees keeping a record of the accomplishments for the kingdom of God, the Pharisees. They were promoting division instead of unity. And you all know something about that. So to get to Galilee, Jesus had to go through Samaria and he stopped at the town of Sychar. And the Bible says, just as he had stopped in the city of Sychar, which was in Samaria, he had to go through Samaria. That's the scripture. It says he had to go through Samaria. It's just like we had to go through 2020. The difference is, is that Jesus didn't really have to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go. He had the power not to go. He didn't have to go, but scripture said he had to go. And it was not because of a destination. It's because he had to do the work according to the will of his father. He had to submit to the will of his father. He had to submit to the will of his father. He had to. Think about if we had that type of commitment to God. There's some things that you have to do. Amen. I have to pray. I have to praise his name. I don't have a choice in the matter. I have to keep my faith. I don't depend upon my emotions or my feelings whether I'm going to believe and trust in God. I have to live the life that I live today. 
So the Bible says it was around noontime in the heat of the day and Jesus had gotten tired and worn out from the trip. Watch this. He got tired and worn out from the trip and now he's sitting on top of Jacob's well while his disciples had gone into the village to get some food. What? He's sitting on top of Jacob's well, tired and worn out. I don't know about you, but 2020 wore me out. He was tired of the journey. Am I boring you all? I said he was tired from the trip that he was taking. People have been worn out naturally, and some people have been worn out spiritually. Worn out by misinformation. Every day we have been trying to figure out what is truth and what is a lie. It has worn some people out. People have been worn out by misdirection. Should we wear a mask? Shouldn't we wear a mask? It wore some people out. Wore out by conflicting reports by news agencies and reporters. It has wore us out. Should we get the vaccine? Shouldn't we get the vaccine? The vaccine is going to kill black folks. It's wearing us out. We've been more worn out with scientists that have turned politicians and politicians that have turned to be scientists. Tired of losing power in our life. No power to change what, what, what everyone else knows is wrong. We don't have the power to make it right. Tired of working at home, being with those kids, being on the Zoom call, teaching them how to do their homework. Tired not having the internet. Tired of isolation. Tired of the same old entertainment. Tired of reruns. Tired of Netflix. Tired of Prime Video. Tired, tired, tired. It wears you out. Powerless and, and helpless and hopeless. People in the body of Christ, people in the world are tired and worn out. We become tired of every day, every single day. We're watching the numbers. We're watching the numbers of the COVID virus victims who have passed on. We're looking at the numbers of people that are being afflicted and catching the COVID virus. Then we're looking at the positivity rate every single day. That stuff wears on your mind and it'll wear on your spirit. You gotta be careful because if you look closely, it will feel like the trip is killing us. The journey is ruining people's lives. We're dying in the desert just like those who came out with Moses. A 40 year journey dying in the desert. And as Jesus sat on the well, he did not have anything to draw water out. He was on the well, but he couldn't get the water that was in the well. And then this Samaritan woman walks up to the well. And Jesus asked her, give me a drink. She said, you shouldn't be talking to me. I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew, so you should not even, we shouldn't even have this conversation. Didn't have anything to draw the water out with. Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for the water. Jesus told her, whatsoever drink, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give them shall never thirst again. Jesus was talking about the source of the water. The woman was talking about getting her water out of the well. And Jesus had a different well and a different water and a different source that he was talking about. He was saying if you drink the living water, you will never be thirsty again. If you drink this water, you will have a power that will never fade away. And sometimes when we talk we got to separate the natural from the spiritual. It's the natural things that are not permanent. They're temporary. It's the spiritual things that become permanent. And they last forever even when we cross over into eternity. 
The living water ensures that she would never ever thirst again if you're tapping to the right power source. This is Jesus having this conversation. There is more power in the nuclear plant than this man, my neighbor, was protecting. It's the plant that lights up Chicago and all the surrounding suburbs. What do you want to do? Do you want to be connected to that or connected to some ever-ready batteries? You got to know the difference. You got to know if you're tapped into the natural or tapped into the spiritual. What happens when your power source loses its power? What happens when your money runs out? What happens to the gamesmanship that we play? What happens when the trend shifted and you're not where you used to be? There's more power and you got to make sure you're connected to the right power source. But Jesus is sitting on the well. He's tired from the trip. But he's sitting on the well. He's sitting as the Samaritan woman walks up to the well. He's tired. Scripture says he's worn out, but he's getting ready to minister. Watch this closely. He's getting ready to minister, Reverend Cobb, while he's tired. Yeah. Yeah. When most Christians get worn out, they don't minister, they don't come to church, they don't sing, they don't preach, they don't praise, they don't play, they don't do the will of God because they're tapped into the wrong power source. And I stopped by this morning just to let you know that you can be worn out and have power at the same time. Jesus is demonstrating, I can sit right here worn out, tired from a long day's journey, but I'm still connected to something that has power. So even though we've gone through the storm, we've gone through the rain, and I know some of you all have been depressed, some of you all have been tired, but I'm here, I'm here this morning to let you know you still have a source of power so that you can live. That's what connection can do. I don't care which party is in office. I don't care who's up, who's down. I don't care the temperature of the environment. It doesn't make any difference when you hook up to Jesus. I wish I had a prayer church. When you hooked up to Jesus, it doesn't make any difference what the doctor's report is. You're hooked up to the real power source. He's sitting there ministering to this woman. It's like preachers have a term that says something like, uh, we can lead and bleed at the same time. We have to suffer and be humans because we're tapped into the natural side. But at the same time, we still have to minister. We still have to be the preacher. We still have to go forth in faith. So we're tapped into the natural, but we must also be tapped into the spiritual. When things are going down and somebody cusses you out, and the protesters come against us, and things look like it's going astray, you still got to be able to stand back and say, I don't care what I see. I know what I know. I'm hooked into something that will always tell me that the enemies can come against me, but they can't win. I'm hooked up to a sword that says no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. I'm hooked up to a power source. 
I'm hooked up to a power source that says I may be afflicted in my body, but my spirit is still strong. The power source. So he's sitting here, he's ministering to the Samaritan woman, and then when he finishes that uh, 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 ministering to her, the Bible says his disciples come back from the grocery store. They went to get some food from all these. They come back. Jesus has already preached his little sermon. He's already given the woman salvation. She goes back to town and tells everybody about Jesus. The disciples come back and they have a bag of food but Jesus is not eating. Read it when you get home. The disciples asked him, he said, they say, Rabbi, aren't you eating? Jesus is sitting on the well worn out. Rabbi, you want something to eat? No, I'm not hungry. Rabbi, aren't you going to eat? So the disciples were puzzled and they started thinking. They said, while we went to the store, somebody brought Jesus some food. Because when we left, Jesus was tired, worn out, and hungry. When we came back, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said, I'm not Hungry. Somebody must have brought him some food. If you read between 33, 34, 35, it says Jesus implied I already ate. Didn't nobody bring him any food. He said, I already ate the will of my father. So while you were depending on natural food, he says, I was eating spiritual food. The natural and the spiritual. They were puzzled. How can you sit here and not eat? You traveled a long day's journey. Some of you all have been through all of 2020. Some of you all have lost loved ones and you suffered your way through. And somebody's asking the question, how in the world can you still make it come into God's house and still praise him after all you've been through? Somebody must have fed you something. Where did you get that kind of power from? You got to shout back at him and say, because I'm connected to the right power source. It hasn't been easy, but I'm connected to the right power source. And here's what he says. And I don't know why he said it. You gotta use your imagination because scripture is clear to Stephen Richardson. He says this. He's sitting on the well, he's ministered to the lady, he's tired of the light on the of, of the long journey. The disciples come back. Offer him food, and he says, I ate already. <laughs> While y'all was gone shopping, my Lord supplied all my needs. And you wondering how I can stand the storms of life and last even through the fiery furnace. And while the lion had to shut his mouth, I made it when others didn't. So they couldn't understand they were puzzled. Jesus tells them, he says, what season is it? What time is it? This, 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 this for you. Those of you sitting right there. He says, what time is it? What, 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 what season is it right now? They're looking around. Still puzzled. What 
is he talking about? He says, when is the harvest? Mm. 